Welcome back to another episode of Straight Facts. It's your boy, Jake Galley. No James Jackson, no Kyle Sirik, just me and my guys, Stat Matt Robinson, here uh, on this one presented by the Up On Game Network. Matt, what's going on, my man? It's going well. Eagles won a game that should have been played on uh, Sunday, but they won it on a Tuesday. Um, so, rocking my Eagles Christmas. Is uh Love it's the rebuilding year, but we're 500. Was that not one of like the ugliest first halves of football you've ever seen? The first quarter, really, of football. Yeah. Like I was like, I I considered turning off the game. I was so frustrated. The, ho the holding on my lotta after we already had the first down, really, real. That's when I was like, oh my god, this is just horrible. Yeah, Eagles offense in the first quarter was in the giving spirit, but because. We are coming up on Christmas here. We're going to talk about uh, some of the best gifts in sports history can range from lopsided trades to just a uh, happenstance that, that was fortunate for someone. Uh, but we'll go down the list here. Matt, why don't you start us off with your uh, first gift, biggest gift in sports history? Uh, the biggest gift in sports history, uh, I'm going to go all the way back to 1919 where the Boston Red Sox sold Babe Ruth to the New York Yankees leading to an 86 year curse while the Red Sox watched their arch rivals win 26 World Series before they won their next one um, and famously that was to fund a play just because the, the guy wanted to uh uh, the owner of the Red Sox didn't have enough funding for a play. He wanted to go on Broadway, which is really funny. And uh, so he sold Babe Ruth to the Yankees to fund the play. And then the Yankees got the best show in baseball history at the time <laughs> for the next 15 years. Yeah, it's ironic how that works out. And uh, looking down the list, it's kind of surprising. Well, I guess it's not really that surprising when you consider how dominant all of their sports have been throughout their existence. But like Boston is all over this list. Um, different teams too, Celtics, uh, the Red Sox. In this uh, in this instance, they are unfortunate. Um, but a couple more that we'll get to where they were very, very fortunate, uh, got good gifts. But my number one is a team that uh, some may call America's team. I know a lot of the people on the East Coast aren't big fans of them. The Dallas Cowboys, specifically the leading rusher of all time, Emmett Smith. What a gift he got by being drafted into that Dallas team with Troy Aikman and the Dallas O-line. Uh, and of course, all of the success that is to come for that team. He, I was looking for him on the list of yards per rushing attempt. And you said he's what, 4.3? yards 4 per 4.2 4 yards per attempt so to give you uh, a little side-by-side -side comparison there's some other guys who average 4.2 yards per rush in their nfl career the garrett blunt eddie lacy uh thurman thomas kevin falk todd Gurley, darren mcfadden and there he is Tied with Matt Forte down at the bottom here. Emmett Smith. Obviously, we've talked a lot about uh, on the podcast, like how devalued running backs were. He was in like the golden era, the golden age of when they didn't know you could throw to the running back and just spam that. And the defense has really no answer for a lot of the teams. Um, but like, and and by the way, we, we, we also looked up like the prime of his career because you're like, oh, it's, it's unfair to look at that because he had a really bad end of his career but when you look at i think it was like what were the years if you go from the i'll i'll, I'll even be a little more generous let's so take out his rookie year where he averaged 3.9 he had a peak from 91 to 95 where he averaged uh four point it's still 4.5 even so 4.5 yards per carry um and that's when the cowboys won the three super bowls in four years he was first team all pro four consecutive seasons um, and he had an unbelievable season in 93 where he actually held out for the first two games of the season. The Cowboys went 0-2. Then he came back and he averaged 5.3 yards per carry and ran for 1,400 yards um, in just 14 games. 
Yeah, he's looking at like 24, 25 attempts per game in the crux of his career when he was making all of the All-Pros with Dallas. But like you look at 4.5, some of the names that come up are like Mark Ingram. Like if you put like uh, if you put Mark Ingram on those Dallas teams, is, is this telling me that Mark, that Mark Ingram would have been the leading rusher had he gotten the same amount of attempts i mean it's really it really is a sickening for me it's it's the durability factor of uh emmett because he he it's it's the fact that he never he played he never got hurt from 1990 through 2002 the fewest amount of games he played in a season was 14 so the he was a running back that stayed durable and it's going to sound disrespectful when I say this, but it's almost like an Eli Manning thing Whew. where like j- just being pretty good for a long time and staying healthy is like a really valuable thing. Yeah. And it again helps that he's on the prestige of the Dallas Cowboys in the 1990s, the dynasty that they had. It all leads to it. And before we move on, while I'm looking at this yards per rushing attempt list, uh, number four and number six all time are currently active in the NFL. One is a quarterback, one is a running back. Can you guess the two? 5.6 and 5.3, respectively. Uh, Lamar Jackson. No. Ooh. He's not... I'm actually looking... I don't know if he's... He might not be qualified. Um, is it? Is it Rodgers? It is not. Uh, the quarterback is Russell Wilson with five. Oh, I should have gotten that. I should have gotten but that. But now that you bring up Lamar, uh, while you think, I'm going to look up Lamar's stats while you guess the running back. The running back kind of surprised me. Uh, has the running back been in the league longer than like four years? They are right on the cusp. Uh, they okay. have been in the NFL for four seasons this year. Four seasons? Yeah. Um,. It's not Derrick Henry. It is not. I know. I know that because in the beginning he was kind of his yards per carry kind of shaky. Um, I'm gonna go with Miles Sanders. That's <laughs> a fun guess. It's it is Nick Chubb with five point three. I feel like Nick Chubb gets is it, he has to be one of the most overlooked backs in the league, mainly because they brought in Kareem Hunt, but like. Year in, year out, just a solid, a solid, it just, it just popped off the page to me. By the way, I, I found it. Lamar Jackson, six yards per carry, uh, would be third all time in yards per attempt. I guess there is some qualifier that he doesn't make the list. But. Miles Sanders at 5.1. That wasn't too far off. Wow. That's yeah, not a bad guess. Um, okay. Let's, let's move along here. Uh, um, I just want to mention the trade. Um, the Vikings basically made the trade for Herschel Walker, not thinking that the Cowboys would cut the players that the conditional draft picks were tied to, and that's how Jimmy Johnson took advantage of it. Yeah. Uh, that's before they had, like, you know, rules, a media circus, 24-7 coverage of the NFL. You can get away with sort of things like that. Um, yeah, they, they had a first, a sec- two firsts, uh, two seconds, and a third, all conditioned on whether the Cowboys would cut players that were traded to them and they cut all of them <laughs> that's a pretty alpha move like get alpha get alpha vikings <laughs> all right uh i'll actually roll along because this is one that burns me up inside to the day watching this guy play uh in the green and white one of the biggest gifts in nba history is not only did the philadelphia 76ers as we know very well move up in the draft to take the one of the bigger busts taken first overall, Markel Fultz. They gave draft, draft assets to do so to their rival, the Boston Celtics, who ended up taking Jason Tatum, and reports said that they probably were going to take uh, Tatum first overall anyway. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. I don't know, dude. It's the Celtics. They would do something like that. No, I don't buy it. I think they valued them like very equally. And they knew the Sixers valued Fultz highly. And I slam Colangelo for a lot, but again, you can't really... Be- it's tough luck when the guy you draft forgets how to shoot. It's not really pre- unprecedented. And the Sixers got a little lucky in that scenario in the sense that the Kings pick that they gave up was actually like the one year the Kings were like half decent. 
So that pick wound up being like the 13th or 14th pick in the draft. It wasn't like a top five pick that they wound up giving up. But that yeah. was more luck than anything. They rolled, uh, they rolled very well in terms of kind of tight rope walking, um, getting out of the Fultz thing because they also then parlayed Markel Fultz into Tyrese Maxey. That, the pick that became Tyrese Maxey. Um, so I, I, I think the thing that bothers me, bothers me the most is Boston has a reputation for like leveraging the information in the draft over these teams, mainly the Sixers, and getting assets out of it. Another example would be, and this is not a gift, this is actually probably more of a gift for the Sixers in this regard, but uh, they, they I, I remember they moved like two or three seconds in exchange for Fult or for Thibel. Mm -hmm. And at the time, that was another one where it was like, all right, here we go. Boston, once again, pulling the wool on um, fleecing fleecing the Sixers once again. So Yeah, Sixers fans were really mad we didn't get Carson Edwards. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's funny, how, <laughs> it's funny how things work out. I was one of those people. I know for a fact I was. Um, so want to move on to the next one. What, what do you have on the dock? Yeah, so for the next one... It's another, we're just going to keep going with the Celtics, is the Nets giving up a zillion picks uh, for Paul Pierce and uh, Kevin Garnett, uh, which they made a second round appearance for. So good job for the Nets. But, in, but because of that trade, the Celtics got uh, Tatum, essentially. Um, they got Marcus Smart. They got um, Jalen Brown. And they got, uh, there's one other player that they got. Um, I don't think he panned out though. Um, and so that basically set them up and they almost made the NBA finals in the bubble year. Uh, but funny thing is now that the, now the Nets are, the Celtics had a golden hand and they didn't take full advantage of it. And now they are 500 while the Nets are the clear favorite. So. Yeah the Nets making it all the way to the Eastern Conference Finals. And it really, it really does in the NBA kind of come down to, can you land big free agents? Like, if you are dependent on, dra well, I sh if you're dependent on drafting players and you're not getting those draft picks from like, like the Nets did or like the Celtics did, trading away stars to get a, a ton of picks, you're so screwed, even still, with the new Supermax deals that they put in place to try and get these superstars from, from leaving where they're drafted so soon. Like, you're still just so screwed. Which brings me to one of the bigger gifts in sports history. Throughout uh, the decades that this team has been on top, has there ever been a bigger gift, a bigger glow-up, than moving from Minneapolis to Los Angeles, keeping the name the Lakers. There's Which no doesn't La make sense. There's no lakes in LA. It doesn't matter. We're still the Lakers. And that saw them reap the rewards of Shaquille O'Neal coming to LA. And then more recently, LeBron James pretty much manifesting we like... We forgot a big one. Kareem. Kareem is another big one. You're right. I did he forget. He forced out of Milwaukee he to go to He was the original. LA. And even before that, he didn't force his way out of anywhere, I don't believe. But Wilt Chamberlain going to L.A. as a free agent as well. Or was that a trade? That was a trade. Yeah, it was just a, just a, yeah. Uh, but throughout the years, L.A. has, especially in recent times, done a lot of things wrong. Like, a lot of things wrong. You look at this offseason, it's like a huge head-scratcher as to why Russell Westbrook is on that team. <laughs> That's like a cringe compilation play by the GM there. And it still really might not even matter because of the pull of LeBron James. Yeah, it's, it was so, one of the reasons I hated the last Lakers title so much, other than I've hated the Lakers my whole life, is the fact they did everything wrong for years. They were horrible. The Sixers rebuilt way better than the Lakers did. Um, and the fact that LeBron picked them, hey, it's Lakers, that's cool. Just because it's the Lakers, the prestige is just... I don't blame LeBron for it, but it's just so annoying that it's just the prestige of the brand that gets them a, a, a title, which is how they won their title in 2020. Um,
it, it, over like good team building, which is why I actually don't hate the Nets, not as much as I hate the Lakers, because the Nets, after they destroyed their team with the horrible trade of the Celtics that we just mentioned, built their team up to like a decent, like competitive playoff side with the Angela Russell and Jared Allen that lost to the Sixers. And that made Kyrie and KD and Harden want to go there instead of the Knicks. You want to talk so, about a gift. Harden going to that team for the package they gave up, that could be categorized. Well, Jared, Jared, Jared Allen's uh, turned out to be good, but the, the Rockets didn't reap the rewards of that. That's the <laughs> He's not on the Rockets. Yeah. Who gave up Harden? <laughs> uh, so, and, and also just the last point here is that it really isn't just the Lakers who are reaping the rewards of, and, and being gifted um, things because they're in L.A., the team that they share a stadium with had a similar uh, offseason a, f- a few offseasons ago when they brought in Kawhi Leonard just because, hey, I want to, you know, I don't really want to play with LeBron. I want to be at home. All right. Clippers, like, fine. Yeah, but they built a decent squad with, like, the Blake Griffin, Chris Paul they years. Did. And then they, they had a decent, like, team with, like, Lou Williams, too. But as we're, since we're talking about LeBron, I think one of the biggest gifts ever is just the fact that uh, the baby Jesus of Akron was born by the name of LeBron James right outside of Cleveland, which is the only reason Cleveland has a title in any sport since 1964. Because, yes, he would have been drafted by Cleveland number one overall, but he would not have gone back to Cleveland if he wasn't from there. And he went back to Cleveland despite the fact that the owner completely, basically slandered him in public. Um... And he went back because he cared about the city enough and they made four finals and they won one miraculously because of LeBron. And now Cleveland has their sports Jesus who promise who 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 took them to the promised land. That's a little Moses in there. But. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I like the holiday spirit. And it's it's really beyond like him coming back, he also probably maybe he doesn't sign the with the way they did not build around him. He might not even sign the second contract um, to come back, and then and then that really like kind of shit. Maybe we're looking at a multi-time uh, Detroit Piston champions. I, I don't know. I mean, there's there's a lot of things that that could have uh, changed because of that. But we're gonna move on here, and we're gonna do a little cross sport action with this segment. Can he win it? Very simple, uh, very straightforward. We're gonna look at a couple different awards in the NFL and the NBA and we're going to look at some long shots or or intermediate shots to win some player awards starting with the MVP award we're going to go to uh, our favorite guy our beloved Joel Embiid missed out on it last year because of a lack of games played or I mean you could say it's a coin flip regardless uh, with Jokic but either way he's sitting at 39 to 1 right now to win the NBA MVP, he missed nine games with COVID uh, last year. It was a 10-game stretch that took him out of the MVP discussion. The Sixers are 13 and five with him, three and eight without him this year. Same old story. Uh, and this year, he's averaging 25.1 points, 10.9 rebounds, 4.4 assists, uh, 1.2 blocks, and one steal. So compared to last year, that's about three less points similar rebounds more assists and the the one thing that is a little concerning to me is that his shooting splits have dropped uh in all areas 45 percent from the field 35 percent from three 80 percent from the free throw arc matt can he that win new, the that, nba mvp he can because he has been the most clutch player in the nba this year he is averaging 6.3 uh points per game in the clutch this year which is 1.5 clear points of second place, which is LeBron. And to put that in perspective, 1.5 points per game, the margin between him and second is the same as the difference between LeBron and Devin Booker, who is in 20th. So Joel Embiid has been a monster down the clutch for the Sixers this year. That Celtics game the other night was so great where he was just sitting shot on the wing after win- he had 17 points in the last uh, five minutes of the game. If he continues this clutch streak and gets more adjusted to the ball, which he said he was struggling with in the beginning of the year, and doesn't contract COVID or stay healthy, he can win the MVP, um, especially with the just the 
sheer difference the Sixers are when he's on the court versus when he's not. Yeah, and they still really have, and Andre Drummond has been probably the best replacement for Joel Embiid uh, that he's had in his career. Um, but even, even with that being said, like the absence of Joel Embiid is still larger than the absence of just about any other NBA player on their respective team among the contenders. I mean, obviously, if you take, I don't know, if you were to take who's like, I don't know, Jonas Valanciunas off of uh, <laughs> the Pelicans, they'd be a really bad team. Um, but my thing with Embiid, and I don't know if you still have the numbers up in front of you for the clutch uh, statistics, but that's interesting to hear because the big plague of, of, of Joel Embiid has been in the clutch, in the playoffs, he has not been efficient. He's been a turnover machine. Um, and, and that's maybe a product of the playoff, uh, uh, the way they call fouls or don't call fouls in the playoffs. But I'd be interested to see how his field goal percentage in the clutch stacks up against the other guys. I, I think it's more just less hesitancy. A lot, like in the past, he's like you said, he's tried to bait for fouls. Now he's just going, he's just going for it. And I think the big moment in the clutch last year that gets understated is the three he made to tie the game against the Jazz in the regular season over Bogdanovich, and then they won in overtime. I think that uh, in the playoffs, he was playing with like a torn meniscus, so I give him a little bit of a pass. But I think he's just become more decisive. He A lot of the time, he overthinks what to do, and he forces things. And now he's just going, he's acting like it's a normal possession, and... And be acting like it's a normal possession means he's a top three player in the game. And I tweeted out to my guy, Quentin Mayo, who does a great job covering the Washington Wizards for NBC Sports. Uh, he tweeted a clip of all of Embiid's possessions. And there was like a stretch in the third quarter against Boston, uh, all of his possessions against Boston. Uh, there was a stretch in the third quarter where he hit a, he faced up, took Cantor, or excuse me, Freedom, on the dribble, uh, or off bounce, like step back, hits a mid-range over him, next possession comes down, makes one hard pound dribble, goes right to the rack by him, and then on the third possession, uh, they send the double, and he immediately whips the ball to, I think it was Curry in the corner, and it's like, when he is able to, and I tweeted this to my guy Quentin, like when he's able to be decisive, there is no guarding Joel Embiid. There's no guard. You can foul him. You can send him to the line. But when he is decisive, I agree. He's one of the best players in the league. I just worry in terms of getting back to this award. I don't know if Steph Curry and KD are going to let anyone in this race with the uh, high scoring. And that's ultimately what people come to say. I mean, Nabeed's a great defender. Uh, his magnetism on defense is, is the reason that the Sixers are so bad without him when he's not in there. But, like, I just can't see anyone superseding Curry or Durant for this award at this point. So I'm gonna also have to give a shout out to Jokic. His numbers are incredible, ah, it's a and, shame. The, and their on off number and his on off numbers are crazy too. It's like, all right, buddy, all right, but all right, you, we already gave the one MVP. You're too unathletic. We can't give yeah. you two. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's it's tough out here for the Eastern yeah. Europeans, but we'll move yeah. on now. We'll go to the NFL, and there's a guy, actually two guys, and we'll discuss kind of in tandem here, who have been making. A lot of headlines for their performance in recent weeks, neither of which play the quarterback position. Speaking about Jonathan Taylor, who, if you uh, are betting on FanDuel, is currently plus 950 to win the MVP award. Or if you if you still want to stick with the non-quarterback, uh, actually, I'm looking for the odds right now. Cooper Cup's odds are taken off the board, so I don't have any odds. Oh, really? To, I don't have I any see, odds. I yeah. see on sportsbettingdime.com, I see plus 3,500. Okay, so that makes sense for where he's slotted. He's right between Herbert, who's 32 to 1, and Prescott, who's 40 to 1. So I'll ask you an either or question Jonathan Taylor or Cooper Cup, can either of them win? the MVP this year. Let's just start with that. Jonathan Taylor can. Uh, I would pick Cooper Cup if I was picking between the two of them, though, because uh, I just think wide receivers are a lot more valuable than running backs in general. 
But if you're looking at uh, like the advanced stats, you look at DR, which is the DVOA version for running back, basically yards above for above like average. Um, he is having uh, he is more than double second place, which is Fournette. He is 476 yards above average. Fournette is 224, and he's on pace for the highest uh, DR season by a running back since Adrian Peterson in 2012, who famously is the last running back to win the NFL MVP. Um, and the fact that he people view him as the reason that the Colts are on this streak of hotness, and a lot of he is, but but like people are acting like Wentz has been horrible, and I think it's a lot of recency bias because of the game against the Patriots on Saturday, where. He, Wentz was really poor and Taylor was great. But Wentz has been pretty good. And it's not like a Christian Ponder, Adrian Peterson type season. Wentz has been a pretty good running back and Taylor's been a great running back. Um, and I think, especially after Brady got shut out, um, I think Jonathan Taylor has a real shot to win it. Yeah, as do I. I mean, it's just so rare that you see. And and I also think when, when you speak about how poor, or yeah, I'm going to say how poor, how poor Wentz looked. Uh, I think that's a fair assessment in their last game. And really for the, for the second half of the season so far, I think it skews voters because, you know, cups getting the ball from another borderline MVP candidate. Um, and he's on one of the best teams in the league, you know, without him, they still have Odell Beckham jr. Um, and when healthy Robert Woods for, for the majority of the season, Van Jefferson, another guy. So like when you, when you, when you start to look into the minutia of like, what determines most valuable outside of the quarterback position. I think we get a little hairy for Cooper Cup. I do think Jonathan Taylor can win the award. Now I think will he is is a different question because you have a very muddled quarterback field uh, this year. And Matt, if you had to pick one quarterback who you're giving, who you would say this guy will be the award winner, the MVP award winner this year, who would it be right now? Aaron Rodgers, just because... A lot of Brady's uh, numbers this year are because he's thrown by far the most passes in the NFL. Um, like, he is first in the NFL in passing yards, but he's 12th in yards per attempt. And I think Rodgers has just been more efficient with uh, his uh, balls. Not that Brady hasn't been great, but I think Rodgers, if they hold on to that one seed, I think he gets the MVP. Yeah, we were talking before the show, like, let Rodgers win two straight MVPs, go take Green Bay to the Super Bowl. You might, if you're a Tom Brady fan, you might want to stay off of Twitter for like the off season because there will be some heinous things being said about. Tom I'm Brady. I'm I'm the famous Brady <laughs> hater. I don't think there's an argument for Rodgers over Brady. Well, the I've never tried to make it. The argument that that I hear most people make is most skilled. Like Rodgers is the most skilled. He can make any throw. Roll, you know, with He's the mobility. He's got better arm talent. Yeah, but, exactly. Yeah. That's that's the argument that I hear, and that's what I would assume would be pushed because. It doesn't matter if there is a discussion to be had. Twitter will have it regardless. Yeah. Uh, but let's move on now to defensive player of the year in the NBA. A guy who I uh, once compared on this show his rookie year, three games in, to Michael Jordan. Matisse Thybul, my guy. One of the best defensive guards of all time in the NBA. Not Carson Edwards. <laughs> no, not Carson Edwards. <laughs> Matisse Thybul. Currently on FanDuel, 33-1 to to win the Defensive Player of the Year award. Last year, he was second team all at all defense, despite only playing 20 minutes per game. Now he's up to 25 minutes per game, uh, 1.8 steals, 1.1 blocks per game for Matisse. Uh, he is tied for fourth in the league in defensive field goal percentage allowed, 37%. And that's and and that is also guarding the other team's best player, best wing player, the majority of the time. So I'll kick it to you once again. Can Matisse Thybul be the defensive player of the year? He can because he always seems to show up the most in prime time. Like his best game of the season was against Curry when Curry was going for the record, and he already has the cachet as the name because uh, he built his way up last year. Everyone's like, oh, if he could play more then he could be defensive player of the year. And because the Sixers are massively <laughs> uh, uh, undercut by COVID and lack of Ben Simmons, um, he's playing a lot more minutes and he absolutely could win the award. People are already giving it to Draymond Green. It's a long season. Um, Matisse could absolutely win this award. 
Um, but I would say the only way he wins it is if the unthinkable happens, which I'm not going to say. But in the it's the scenario where he plays more minutes than Joel Embiid, and because I think Embiid is still the defensive anchor on the team. Yeah, and he and Embiid are the uh, are are back in back to back in the defensive player of the year uh, odds, sixth and seventh respectively. And the top five, I'll just name them off: Draymond Green, Rudy Gobert, Giannis, Mikel Bridges, Anthony Davis. Of those five, uh, Davis is no shot. Okay, so Davis, you, you we can cross off. I cross would say off. I would say Giannis. Giannis probably has no shot. Like Giannis will get like a million like fourth place votes just because he's Giannis. If they're gonna give it to like a big, they're probably if you're gonna vote for a big instead of like a wing defender, I would assume you vote for Gobert uh, over Giannis. Even though you could debate Giannis is maybe a wing. One guy that interests me is Mikel Bridges, eighteen to one, has been doing. So I don't have the stats here in front of me. Just eye test. In a lot of their big primetime games, he's taking on the other team's. Uh, best wing defender and shutting them down, which to be fair, Draymond Green is doing too. But I don't know, like if if if, if you're looking at, like I always think about this is this is, you're betting on the, who the media will think it is, not who the actual best defensive player is. It's who the media is going to vote for. So I don't know. Mikael Bridges could be a fun player that the ringer, you know, the ringer writers will start to fetishize and he suddenly becomes the favorite after a few fun articles get put out about his defense. Yeah, the Suns have the third best uh, points per game allowed in the NBA and they have the best record in the NBA. And there's not a lot of people talking about Chris Paul or Devin Booker for MVP. So this could easily be the award where like they thought, oh, we need to give the Suns rep. So let's put Bridges as defensive player of the year. Yeah, and a fun one. This is, I, I don't really think I'm going to answer for you that the answer is no, they have no chance to win this award. But if I told you that there is a guard in the NBA with who is number one in defensive win share, shares and 10th in defensive rating, who are some of the names based off of that that would come to mind? Uh, Like Mike Conley. Mike Conley, maybe, maybe Matisse, maybe Mike. like Alex Caruso if you're talking about yeah, like defensive ratings. What if I told you it was Steph Curry? I, w- I, I, I saw this like a week ago and I looked and I thought, wow, defensive win shares have got a problem. <laughs> I've got a real problem, right? Like what? <laughs> I che- I was looking for people to put on this list. And like I- Chris Paul's right behind him. Yeah, yeah. It, it's nuts. But Curry, to his credit, that's been uh, an area that has needed improving for a long time. And he's seemingly, I mean, their entire, it's, it's probably padded a little bit by the fact that they're a really good defensive team. Like if you look at the top defensive rating, uh, five of the top 11 are Golden State Warriors. <laughs> yep. So That tends to happen. Yeah, it's a little skewed. <laughs> the defensive stats can be skewed. Written, written I said, like, it, it, people, want, if I were to, if we were to vote right now, I would vote Draymond without a second. But I just think it's a long season. Draymond's been unbelievable. He's the reason why the Warriors' defense has been that good. And he's kind of admitted that, like, he didn't try as much when they weren't contending. And now he's trying again, which I find kind of funny. And I, if professionally honest. But there's no... We're talking about Kenny Winnett. There's no chance Curry wins the award when Draymond Green is on his team. Yeah. Right, Even Wiggins, I think, might win it over good before team. him. Yeah, you've got, like, a lot of people on the Gold... That's like actually a really good point. A lot of players on the Golden State Warriors that would come before... Steph Curry, but that was, I mean, he's 490 to 1 to win the award. It was really just kind of more of a joke uh, seeing that statistic. But we'll close out here with the rookie of the year. And we'll start, we will start in the NFL. Jamar Chase was once the favorite. What, as of week seven, if I told you that there would be someone other than Jamar Chase as the favorite for rookie of the year, you would have called me insane. Now, Mac Jones, uh, last week he was minus 500. This week, He's minus 800 to win the award. Is there any way that Jamar Chase can make a comeback? Yeah, Mac Jones could collapse. <laughs> it's really that simple. So um, he's a rookie quarterback. He's as in like a huge spotlight. He had a, they had a shot to be the one seed, and he did not play well against the Colts on Saturday night. If they wind up choking that division away, and Chase has some big games and leads the Bengals to winning that division. Chase could absolutely win that award. 
Yeah. Minus eight hundred for Mac Jones is way too high. It, I, I would agree. I put it. I put it at like my, I put it at like minus like three hundred. It's weird that moving from minus five hundred to minus eight hundred. Like, who is putting money on Mac Jones at minus five hundred? That you feel it's necessary that you need to move the line. I don't know. Uh, I I have a hard time saying Jamar Chase at this point is going to be able to come back because and, and win this award. Because just look at how the Bengals' offense has operated in these past couple of weeks. We have seen uh, T, or T. Higgins and specifically Tyler Boyd. Granted, he was he was kind of aided by a really long touchdown. But when you look at the stats from the past couple of weeks, um, they're starting to become a more spread out off more spread offense, not a literal spread offense, but they've spread the ball around more to these other targets, Joe Mixon as well. And it's just it's going to take. For him to have like two or three weeks where he is back to his old ways of you know two touchdowns 130 yards six catches like he's gonna need that against the jags coming up here so i'm gonna say no uh you say yes he could the thing is mac jones hasn't been like spectacular he's just been like solid right that's all he's been <laughs> but it's the quarterback tax i mean there's a quarterback there's a there's a quarterback the rookie of the year team. isn't like most valuable player it's just I like agree. who's been the best rookie no, I agree. And someone who we missed, by the way, who I'll just, we'll touch on in passing, Defensive Player of the Year, Michael Parsons is going to win defense. Like, I, he's the third favorite yeah. right now. Michael Parsons should win Defensive Player of the Year. That guy is insane. He's Lawrence Taylor. They drafted Lawrence Taylor. That's great. <laughs> That's all that I have to say uh. about him. Though. But uh, we'll move on here to the last guy. Moving over to the NBA, the third favorite in Rookie of the Year voting. Scotty Barnes plus 320. We we highlighted Scotty Barnes, I think, as one of like the surprises, or we did a rookie check-in. We talked about Scotty Barnes a few weeks ago. And quietly, he's still been kind of producing the same uh, on, on par with how he was to begin the year. He leads rookies in points per game, field goal percentage. When you look at guys who have taken more than five shots per game, I think is the qualifier I had to throw on it because there are some guys who had like one or two shots per game who made one and that kind of skews it. So I don't count those guys. Tied for first in, th- in rebounding, 8.3 per game. And third in stocks, which is steal and blocks combined with 2.1. He's the third favorite behind Mobley and Cunningham. Does he have a shot? He definitely has a shot, but I think as long as the Cavs have this like really feel-good story, um, Mobley's going to win it. Because he's just been solid. He's been one of the key fun figures on the team. When people think of the Raptors, they think of, they don't really think of like Scotty Barnes as like the guy because he's not. It's more Fred Van Vliet and uh, Siakam when he uh, is healthy. Um, because I, I just see, I just, I, I think the narrative is going to help uh, uh, Evan ah, a lot, <laughs> Mobley a lot. And I think that Scotty Barnes will kind of be, uh, just he doesn't have the, Cache name is Mobley or Cunningham. So I think that's going to hurt him in the long run as well. But he definitely has a shot. Yeah, I think the team the team quality definitely has an impact. The Cavs currently third in the Eastern Conference. Uh, 19 and 12. What? Like, that is... <laughs> I Obviously, like, it's, it's a pretty well-known uh, story. I don't know if you want to call it a story, but pretty well-known that the Cavs have been... Or the Cavs have been good this year, but... I didn't know. I actually didn't know until I just clicked on that they were third in the East with Toronto coming in uh, 10th. It's interesting to me. Cade Cunningham is the second favorite. I guess the statistics are there. I mean, he's averaging 15.3 points per game. He had a horrible start. Yeah, he had a really, really, really bad start. He's only shooting 38%, though. I don't... He's, he's averaging 15, 6, and 5 with uh, two two stocks a game. That's really solid. And he's had a really rough past two games. <laughs> I'm looking at his game right, log. Right, right. He had a he had a difficult start. But uh, to me, I think you could get some value on Scotty Barnes if you are looking to bet. But that's all that we have here for this episode of Straight Facts. Before we get out of here, Matt, do you have anything to say at the buzzer? I just want to say uh, Merry Christmas to our listeners. Thank you for being here for so long and supporting the show. Uh, it's led to great opportunities like we have with Up On Game, and we're so proud of that opportunity, and it's because of the listeners that we have them. So Merry Christmas, 
I wish I could give you presents, but honestly, it's a lot of work to try to, to, to figure where you guys are out. So your Christmas present is this podcast every week. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a good one there, Matt. And uh, in that same theme of long Christmas, uh, our guy, uh, the reason that he is not here, James Jackson, just want to say how incredibly proud that we are of him. Uh he is going to be co-hosting the Two Pros and Cup of Joe show with LeVar Arrington uh, on Christmas Eve. So, uh, I don't know if we've ever really gone through this. James and I have known each other since the first grade. I think James was like, aside from a guy who I currently live with, like probably one of my first friends, like one, like maybe my first friend. And throughout high school, uh, into college, now out of college, we have always desired to, you know, talk sports together. It's, it's been one of the things that we've done the most and, and you'd say the best, uh, when together. And I just got to say, I am so incredibly proud of him for how far he has ascended, um, in this industry and obviously gets a phenomenal opportunity to be on national airwaves. So we just want to say, James, we're proud of you and, uh, we can't wait to listen to that on Christmas Eve, as should you. Uh, but that's all that we have here for today. Thank you for tuning give, in. Give the listeners a time. Yeah, so it is, it's a It's a little bit of a stretch. If you're up, if you're early riser, it is 6 a.m. Uh, to 9 a.m., I believe. James is going to be up, that, and that's Eastern time. Uh, this is recorded, they, they do the podcast on the West Coast. So James is going to be up really early in the morning, uh, preparing for that and then coming on home to uh, be with the family. But yeah, check that out. I think you can find it on iHeartRadio, on Sirius XM, on the Fox Sports channel. But that's all that we have here. For Stat Matt Robinson, I'm Jake Alley, and these have been the facts. Straight up.